The idea of intelligence. Who do we consider intelligent? What exactly comprises intelligence? How can we measure it? These are questions that have caught the interest of thinkers across the globe since civilization began. It makes sense, then, that early psychologists, and indeed the psychologically minded, would pursue different means and measures to examine what makes people think the way they do, and what the range of intelligences might look like. The origin of formalised intelligence testing really began in France, although it has since fallen out of favour, with a man named Alfred Binet, who was commissioned by the French government to analyse school children and create a system of categorisation that would allow teachers and indeed the bureaucrats to assess the performance of children in the French educational system. If you're interested in this early era of intelligence testing, I've done a video that I will link in the description that I did last year talking about that topic, but we're going to move beyond this period for now and consider two prominent measures of intelligence. Briefly, we will discuss IQ, but the main focus of this video will explain and examine the idea of executive function, which has largely taken over a larger role in the way psychologists look at intelligence. It is important to note that there are several competing intelligence theories, including the general measure of intelligence and crystalline and fluid intelligence, but we will not be examining these now. IQ is a measure most of you will be familiar with, an easy-to-digest representation of intelligence described in a single number. It was popularised amongst its contemporaries when the US military used the Stanford Binet test to examine recruits for the draft during the First World War. This not only provided a platform whereby most had encountered an IQ test, or someone who had taken one, but also gave researchers a relatively large pool of data from which to extrapolate the predictive power of IQ in the post-war period. IQ is often lauded as being a device of unprecedented predictive power amongst its supporters, and this is certainly true to an extent, but IQ is in many ways a flawed statistic. Childhood IQ has shown itself to be a relatively successful predictor of educational achievement, employment prospects, career outcomes, and well-being, but this is not replicated in infant studies, and predictions are only valid in Western liberal democratic nations, as opposed to the Third World and the Far East. Correlations between IQ and achievement tests have increased over the years in the West, and studies have suggested that academic achievement can be predicted by IQ with an average 18% variance, although this has been proposed to be as high as 33% in some areas. IQ is also restrictive in that it appears to be very resilient to manipulation, good news for those with a higher IQ who are looking to keep it, but bad news for educators who seek ways to improve the skills and increase the potential of their students. Finally, IQ is a measure of achievement, but not process. It can tell researchers that a person has found a correct answer to a difficult question, but it cannot tell the researcher how that answer was achieved. That's a very brief outline of IQ, and if people are interested, I would be happy to provide a more in-depth video at a later date. For now, it is important for the second concept of this video, and the main one, executive function, to highlight the blind spots of IQ so that the measures of executive function are fully appreciated. The concept of executive function first began taking form in the late 70s, with research examining inhibition. Over time, over 30 have been defined, although this video will only examine the four primary executive functions and their role in cognition. Broadly speaking, they're a collection of cognitive processes that encompasses the regulation, monitoring and control of thought and action. They describe the efficiency with which individuals acquire knowledge. In lay terms, it's best to think about EFs as the set of cognitive structures that underpin your ability to learn, to process new information, and to focus on tasks based on their perceived urgency. Let's go over the definitions of the EFs this video will discuss. Our first executive function is self-regulation, also called emotional regulation, and refers to managing the emotional responses of a given situation to better suit the needs of the present moment. Our second is inhibitory control, also called response inhibition, and it refers to suppressing natural, conditioned or instinctive behaviours in favour of a more appropriate behaviour for the given situation. Thirdly, we have set shifting, which is simply the ability to switch your focus between tasks and subtasks as the situation demands. We'll also be covering working memory, which is a theoretical construct about information processing, suggesting that humans have several mental buffers which hold information for processing and quick recall for a given task. Additionally, if looking into executive function yourself, you may come across the idea of cognitive flexibility. This is simply the ability to plastically adapt your behaviour to find solutions to new problems, and the ability of your brain to remap itself over time, 
This is notable in older people who have experienced cognitive decline. If their brain is more flexible and they perform well on tests, then different areas from remapped neuronal pathways will show up after a functional MRI test, compared to those who perform more poorly, who show increased strain on areas of the brain associated with young problem solving. You may also have heard of the concept of the tabula rasa, the blank slate, that proposes every human is a product only of environmental influences. This clashes against nativists, who argue that we are a product of only genetic predisposition. In the field of developmental psychology, it is generally accepted that humans are a product of a mix of both genetics and environment, and in this case a child's temperament describes the genetic predisposition of a child in terms of mannerisms, personality, tastes and so on. The development of executive functions are thought to begin at home under the auspices of caregiver supervision. Statements made by the caregiver, such as, put the toys away before we start to read, help to develop early inhibitory control and self-regulation. That is where the child begins to think and to game out a situation before taking an action. An example of inhibitory control might be where a child prevents themselves from physically assaulting another child and instead negotiates for access to a toy that the other child has. An example of self-regulation might be self-soothing behaviours where the child is under stress or denied something that they want. Positive reinforcements for executive functions overlap several developmental areas of study. Attachment theory is one such area, and it posits that deep and enduring emotional bonds or attachments are formed between caregivers and children. These are either secure or one of several defined insecure attachments. If you'd like another video on attachment theory, please let me know in the comments below. All we need to keep in mind for the time being, however, is that the development of secure attachments to caregivers appears to lay the groundwork for self-regulation. This is alongside various mediation behaviours by caregivers that account for a child's unique temperamental requirements, that being adapting parenting style to the needs of the child. Research has observed that caregivers that display strong self-regulation themselves are more likely to develop similarly strong behaviours in their children, especially if they promote critical thinking alongside their demonstrations and explain the reasoning for their actions. These actions from the pre-preschool period aid the development of cognitive flexibility, working memory and inhibitory control. But it's not all environmental. Aside from temperament, as mentioned earlier, there are several biological factors that impact how executive functions perform. A Chinese study by Wang Hu Wang Chen and Lu in 2019 noted that modular segregation of task-dependent brain networks contributed to the development of executive function in children. To expand, the brain is divided into several specialised modules, not physically, but conceptually, and they more readily activate in response to certain tasks. These modules specialise further as you go through childhood and adolescence, and Wang et al.'s study examined the degree to which these modules had specialised. This was then found to be correlated with executive function task scores in their 88 participants. This study replicates the results of previous research from 2017, which utilised a much larger and less homogeneous sample of nearly 900 participants. So now we understand a little more about how executive function begins to develop, although research is still ongoing. Where interest really lies, however, is in the predictive power of executive function through education and beyond. Whilst executive function has been shown to be a salient predictor of employment prospects, career outcomes and well-being, and even romantic success, we're going to focus on educational achievement for this video. Researchers utilise several relatively simple methods to test executive functions. One of the most popular is a peg-tapping exercise which was pioneered in 1996 that has participants tap a piece of dowel in response to taps by a researcher. One tap if the researcher taps twice, and two taps if the researcher taps once. This requires the participant to utilise inhibitory control to resist the natural inclination to mirror the tapping pattern of the researcher, and they have to keep the rules of the exercise in mind using their working memory. Most studies also use a Tower of Hanoi task, which many in the UK will certainly be familiar with, where the object of the task is to move a series of tiered rings from one peg to another without placing a larger ring on a smaller one. This tests working memory, set shifting and usually emotional regulation as well. There are dozens of these tests that are used in practice in order to assess accuracy, processing speed and the ratio between the two for various executive functions. I hope it's clear that in performing these tasks, executive functions are usually performed in tandem, and they are difficult to isolate, and that though these tasks sound simple on paper, they are attempting to drill down to the base processes involved in their completion. 
Working memory tests appear to provide the greatest predictive power of any subset of tests. However, it must be said that most researchers had a focus on testing children when they are more readily available, either in late preschool or educational phases of childhood. It is unclear whether distinct changes in executive function can be found at earlier developmental stages due to a general lack of research in this age range. The largest examination to date of the relationship between executive function and academic achievement was performed in the US in 2011. It looked at 1,400 students aged 5 to 17 across 68 sites and was at the time representative of the ethnic demographic breakdown of the US as well. They evaluated their results using the Cognitive Assessment System, or CAS, pioneered by Naglieri, a construct based on PASS theory, which has been around since 1975. PASS theory proposes that cognition, and by extension intelligence, is organised according to processes. PASS is an acronym that stands for Planning, Attention, Simultaneous and Successive, the four primary process types according to the theory. These processes are mappable to different brain areas, similar to the modularization mentioned earlier in the Wang et al. study. Because executive functions are defined by process, they integrate into PASS theory quite well. Going back to the study at hand, however, the researchers surmised that executive function developed most rapidly in the younger age groups and gains declined throughout adolescence. The results also strongly suggested that executive function was related to the past processes required for academic achievement, and this was correlated across age and across different tasks as well. When looking at specifics, research would seem to indicate that certainly for mathematical ability, inhibitory control is the strongest and most salient predictor of mathematical ability when looking at children in preschool and the first year of kindergarten. As little as one year later, however, it appears that working memory takes a stronger role, and the constructs of inhibitory control, working memory and set shifting, become more independent of one another. Working memory is consistently a strong predictor of mathematical success, even up to the age of 15 and beyond. When considering literacy, working memory is also considered to be the prepotent executive function associated with academic success for English comprehension, although the results are mixed. One study found that at age 7, working memory was a significant predictor, but this was not found to be the case later at age 14. This was ascribed to working memory being more linked with the acquisition of literacy language skills as opposed to their maintenance. A similar study a year prior in 2003, however, revealed that non-verbal working memory tasks predicted the achievement levels of 11- and 14-year-old participants. The general consensus across all the research is that the strength of the association between working memory and literacy skills does decrease with age, but the exact nature of the relationship is yet to be determined. It also helps to remember that studies in this area usually utilise small sample sizes, which may lower their generalizability. Interestingly, set shifting does not appear to be correlated with any academic achievement measures insofar as can be assessed. Some of the more contrarian viewers out there may be asking whether or not academic achievement predicts executive function task scores, as opposed to the way in which I have currently been examining the relationship, that being executive function as the predictor. However, this is somewhat refuted by research that observes a clear relationship between working memory deficits and learning disabilities, particularly in children who have been diagnosed with ADHD or disruptive behaviour disorder. To conclude, because this video is getting far too long at this point, executive functions begin to develop before preschool. They are robust enough to be measured using a variety of tasks examining working memory, inhibitory control and set shifting, such as the Tower of Hanoi task. Executive function development appears to be correlated with secure attachments and parental support that demonstrates the effectiveness of utilising EF in everyday life. Biologically speaking, the more modularised the brain becomes during development up to and beyond adolescence, the greater the executive function capacity. The greatest predictor of mathematical and literacy ability appears to be working memory, with mathematics being strongly predicted and predictions for literacy ability decreasing over time. Although particularly in the field of literacy research, scientists are still conflicted as to when this relationship deteriorates. Thank you for listening. This is a bit of a different video I know, so feedback would be greatly appreciated in the comments. And if you have more topics you would like me to cover in the realm of psychology, please let me know. Very special thanks to my patrons who make all of this possible. Thanks again, and have a great week.